58 goddamn seconds of goddamn logos, followed by nearly two minutes of black screen opening credits. Look, I am never gonna hate a film directed by a guy named Bong, okay? On this day, July 1st, 2014. Also cleverly disguised narration. Reading. Go on. Oh, look out. Looks like we have a Captain America in our midst. Violinist, stand up. Come forward. Wow, this is a crazy number of violinists to still be alive amongst the tiny back of the train population. Sit down. Wow, role reversal in less than two minutes out of the first incident. What's the lesson for the viewer here? That both these assholes are stubborn, unpredictable dicks? Or that everyone has a rebellion breaking point? Okay, so they're looking for the protein block that has the secret message in it. But how do they know which one has it? How is it marked? And isn't it lucky this kid didn't bite into it and swallow the capsule before they got here? Also, how many kids have swallowed the secret message before they got here? Octavia Spencer shows up and you're like, she's slumming! But then later after you realize the movie is awesome, you're like, oh, she was reverse slumming and I'm a dick! Entire movie will gloss over how this train is able to operate with frozen track conditions. Discount still alive, John? Holy sh**! Go, Tibby! Go! I don't understand why Tanya didn't simply tell her kid to crawl back to the sleeping quarters way before this. There are no guards behind all these parents, so a kid could easily crawl his way back without being seen. Guy who played a hero literally frozen in ice for several years, and a different hero whose powers were based on fire, the opposite of ice, and who appeared in films titled The Iceman, Playing It Cool, and Winter Soldier, will now grimace while watching snow and ice torture. And I'm positive this means something. I just don't know what. But I'm sending that They give her seven minutes for a speech to tell them they already know, which is a long damn time, but apparently the length of the speech is directly proportional to the amount of time it takes to freeze this dude's arm off. I belong on the head, you belong on the foot. Yes, so it is. I defy you to prove to me that Tilda Swinton isn't going for a Michael Caine impression here. I simply refuse to believe otherwise. Well, we have the... 42 seconds left. By my count, you have nearly five more minutes, but I can see how you think you spoke longer than that. I mean, I was wondering when you'd shut up. You remember what Mason said? She said, put down that useless gun. Yeah, why did she say that anyway? Kind of amazing such an important aspect of your illusion of control is given away with such a careless slip of the tongue. They used up all their bullets four years ago in the last revolt. How come you guys didn't figure this out long before this? Four years is a super long time where you've studied these people, picked up on careless things they say, and so on, to only now figure out they ran out of bullets. They've got no bullets! Come on, this is like a boss with an easily exploitable weak point. Every time he's at the apex of his swing, you launch into his ass. But these guys are gonna pretend like this is something difficult to get through for suspense's sake. Open it. Necessary orders. Ma'am. Are you listening? Convenient babblefish technology just happens to be on the train in the prisoner section. A minute ago, Mason scolded her interpreters because she didn't have time for them to translate her speech. But they have these convenient things for the prison section. She's an addict too. Whoa, dude, hold off on the labels. You need his help. So the protein blocks are made of icky bugs, but I'd like to think Curtis is getting sick from all the CGI. The water supply section? Yeah, it's just a few cars up. If we take it, we have the upper hand. We don't even have to go to the very front. These asshats were planning a revolt any day now, and they had no idea where they should go? They just learned about the water car and its location? This dude sending notes is a f***er for not mentioning that earlier. And yes, I know who's sending the notes, but these guys should at this point be questioning the note writer's authenticity since he just whammied them with super important information at the last minute. How old are you? 17. Back away slowly, dude. Earth? What was it like? Well, see, it was warm and green, and how the f*** have you been on this train for 17 years and not once overheard someone talk about what Earth was like? Are you clairvoyant? Well, you always seem to know what's behind the gates. Casual clairvoyance? How in the name of reason do these soldiers justify wearing hoods that cover up their eyes? Do they know how to use the force? See how callously we kill this innocent fish? Do you not think we will do the same to you? Or wait, are they just coating their axes pre-battle in some catfish blood? Because if so, how the f*** did that ritual ever get started? Axe-wielding dudes versus people who don't have weapons. I guess Curtis and his crew are winning this, but I have no clue how. I'm gonna guess by the sheer luck of film editing and extreme close-ups, they'll come out of this alive. How are any of these people good at hand-to-hand -hand combat after 17 years on a train? New Year's on this train is so important, these evil soldier dudes all still do the big unison countdown, even during an all-out brawl. It's at this point I once again have to ask, this train's been running the same tracks and same bridges for 18 years in frigid temperatures, and I'm just wondering how the maintenance of said tracks and bridges holds up that long in those conditions. Apparently forever, which means suck it laws of thermodynamics. Impact! 
here's yet another reason why this train could not stay in motion for 18 years in a row. Also, this almost has to be something that happens more often than it does, yet it rears its ugly head during the fight scene because, honestly, that fight scene was getting pretty tiresome anyway. Also, literal visual roll credits. This train goes far off the tracks and somehow does not derail. Why are they not killing people? The United Nations isn't going to impose sanctions if you commit war crimes in this situation. Carve these motherfuckers up! There's a tunnel right after Katarina Bridge. Yeah, maybe you should have attacked all these fools while Mason was talking, huh? Movie turns into a night vision castle Wolfenstein of some sort. This asshole here chops his own dude. This is why you don't fight in pitch darkness. Somehow, this supremely lopsided fight will still end up with enough troops on both sides for the battle to continue, somehow. Win in fire! These assholes only think of this halfway through the darkness fight. We're sending fire up to a darkness fight. Let's send a kid. And let's take a long time making a big ceremony out of the whole thing like it's the Olympics or some Off of the phone, yo! What are you doing? Don't look at me, you dozy bugger! My question is, what is everybody doing? They're all just standing there and not killing those filthy tailies. This whole shot doesn't make sense. Also, suddenly everyone has fire after we saw one torch a second ago. Oh no, not Bucky. I mean, Edgar. Also, Edgar dies, fulfilling the current Chris Evans' best friend needs to get killed riding on a train requirement in his contract. Also, there should be massive amounts of dead bodies on the floor, but I think there's like 10. Principal character who dies gets his eyes closed by someone cliche. And Wilford is divine! Wilford is merciful! It was right about here that I realized there was no way this character wasn't going to be played by Ed Harris. I didn't even know he was in the movie, but the Truman Show guided the way. Wilford knows you well, Mr. Curtis Everett. This should be a huge red flag for Curtis, and yet, it is not. I did have both arms. Can't do a lot with one, you know. Tell that to Jim Abbott, dickhead. Jeez, how many takes did this require to get right? Is this entire train car devoted to peach oranges? And is that Bilbo? If you only have sushi twice a year, how does this guy keep his skills sharp? Is he making sushi the other ten months but not letting anyone eat it because it's practice sushi? Or is he such a master he can literally go six months between platings and still execute a perfect ten sushi plate? You eat this. I carried it this whole way through many battles, and yet it's still completely intact. This kid saw the other two kids get taken through this car, which probably means these kids are in this car at all hours of the day. Because, if I recall, Andrew's punishment for trying to hide his kid took place at night. So the real nightmare is these kids are in school 24 hours a day, and on holidays since it's New Year's Day and all. Impervious to the extreme cold of the Arctic and the scorching heat of the African desert, Wilford's medical train is self-sustaining. That's literally all they say about how the train can stay running all this time. And it's not even an explanation. But Mr. Wilford knew something they did not. And what was that? Old word people were frigging morons. The other nightmare of this classroom is that they are taught this Wilford stuff 24 hours a day, which is proved by the fact that every one of these kids knows all this stuff by heart. And we're once again shown a video about it. I think I'd rather stay in the tail section. I also wonder, is this the only classroom? Aren't there kids of all ages on this train? Or do they control the births to only happen once every 13 years or so so they can keep one classroom? What happens if the engine stops? We all freeze and die. Even the song doesn't have any damn answers. Also, what the f*** am I watching? Fifteen years ago, in the third year of the train, seven passengers tried to stop Wilford's miracle train. Jesus, each new car they walk into just happens to be chugging past some important landmark in this train's history. This thing goes around the world and passes by many nondescript areas, but on the day of the revolt, it's a veritable history lesson. I guess shooting these guys' chains off is really that easy. Yeah, I guess this is sad, but for an audience member, this feels like sweet relief. This poor bastard was already mostly dead, and I'm not talking about the Princess Bride, where you hoped he could hang on. The man had an umbrella for an arm. What? It wasn't me! First act of this leader and supposed hero's regime? Murder the shit out of someone. I feel like this train should be running into a lot more snowdrifts than it is. The director said, let's have an entire stateroom car devoted to a creepy dude peeling an apple. It'll make the front of the train citizens look even more like assholes. Ah, dentist's office. I bet his ass is busy as considering he's the only dentist in Does this train also have a doctor, a shrink, an optometrist, a urologist? So, the school children march through all these f***ing train cars on their way to school every day? Also, I actually kind of feel bad for these entitled people on the train, because everywhere they decide to be, they have to walk through miles of train to get there. Unless they have some sort of transportation on the side of the train, like an Uber or something. So, this is a cool movie, and we enjoy the s*** out of it. But especially this part here, which is as clever as anything you'll see in an action movie. So, we will remove five sins for this awesomeness. Good to see the train has pools for its elite members, but these are some really awkward and truly s*** pools. Wait, the kids also walk through this yellow Darth Vader room on their way to school? Do we even ever get to see the apartment cars where the f***ing families live? We don't? Outstanding! Guy trying to stab another guy, but they have an arm wrestling match before the stab happens cliche. If Nam could somehow hide in here, then certainly Yona could have hidden better than she did. But I'm trying to figure out where the hell Nam came from in this super small compartment. We're gonna find him. I promise. Unkeepable promise, the movie will make keepable. Thank you. Way too long death scene is way too long. 
They killed that old guy from that one movie. Then they killed the black lady from the helm. Now he's finally pissed enough to fight back. I'm still keeping track of all the train cars the school kids have to pass through on their way to the school car, which is now like nine cars back. And this is the weirdest car yet. And I can only imagine the kids walking through these tattooed unisex hookah orgies asking each other, Hey, who is the 11th president of the United States, dog? I think it's obvious at this point that whoever wrote the part of the script that contained the schoolroom walked off the project, and a new writer was brought in and was told nothing about the schoolroom sequence. Okay, so how many residential cars did they skip over to get to this point? I mean, there's a whole society living on this train, but no one apparently has a home to get back to. The students stay in school all the time, the ravers rave, and so on. It makes me wonder if the teacher got impregnated while in class. It's a thousand people in an iron box. No food, no water. How did you not all die within weeks? After a month, we ate the week. The following scene is a harrowing tale of cannibalism, and the tale of how Gilliam took off his arm so that a young Curtis wouldn't eat a baby Edgar. That's all fine and good, but what I'm wondering is why did Wilfred even bother picking up these people if he never intended to feed them? If he truly needed tailies to produce child labor to keep the engine running, wouldn't you want them to survive? You know what I hate about myself? I know what people taste like. Chicken? I know that babies taste best. Veal? That baby was Edgar. Billy Elliot? He died like a bitch. You should have eaten him back when he was delicious. And I was the man with the knife. He told this story in the third person to make this reveal more reveal-y. This guy is fucking wasting the last cigarette on Earth. And then one by one, other people in the tail section started cutting off arms and legs and offering them. What the fuck? Really? What did you do with all the blood? And how can that many people seriously get through the cutting off of their own limb without anesthetic or other drugs? This is some bull here. Also, in an alternate universe, these limbs were all supplied by the Star Wars prequels, and no one had to self-dismember. Do you think my station is without its own drawbacks? It's noisy, and it's lonely. But, did you eat baby? That wasn't what Gilliam and I had in our plan. What? No, don't tell me you didn't know. Yeah, it was so freaking obvious. The way Gilliam kept helping and planning stuff out for the Rebels. He was clearly working with Wilford. I'll miss Gilliam. I'll miss our late night phone chats. He could go on for hours. All with only one arm. What does the number of arms someone has have anything to do with their ability to talk for a long time? This guy has a knife stuck in his belly. He's been bleeding out. Unless you tell me he's a cyborg, he should pretty well be dead. Well, good thing Yona woke Nam up before this guy came in for the attack. By the way, where was her clairvoyance during this scene? Okay, ominous army here, but this is a classic bottleneck. And even these two people should be able to handle this army one at a time. I mean, as Gilliam well understood, we need to maintain a proper balance of anxiety and fear. This whole scene here at the end is so reminiscent of the Architect Neo scene from The Matrix Reloaded that I wonder if they took the script and simply changed character names and swapped Matrix for Train. I want you to take my station. Wow, oh, just as vague as ever. Why did you write this stupid note anyway? Because you wanted to keep tradition alive? You know that the guy you need to communicate with is right here, right? And you may as well have written vague message on this and it would have been the same damn thing. You must tend the engine. Keep her humming. But I know nothing about engines, and you've taught me nothing! Look at them. That's how people are. The crazy guy justifies his actions because humans are awful cliche. That piece of equipment went extinct recently. We needed a replacement. Thank goodness the tail section manufactures a steady supply of kids. So now the truth comes out about why they needed the people in the tail section. It had nothing to do with balancing a closed ecosystem. They needed kids to run the engine. Problem is, Wilfred says the engine problem only happened recently. It's recently 18 years ago? Because how did you know you needed a small child to keep this running way back then? Matchbook climactically only has one match left. By the way, when did all these angry rave people suddenly decide to stop trying to get across the bridge to kill Nam? They were pretty pointless. Thankfully, this climax happened in the Himalayas for optimal survival chances. Yona and Timmy survived this. So, there's hope for humanity after all. Um, but is Yona gonna have to have sex with Timmy when he's old enough to do so? Or is there hope that there are survivors around? The polar bear might be a clue that humans might have survived too, but let's say they are the last two people on Earth. We have that whole Noah's Ark argument again, and I'd rather not think about that. Fate depends on this man. Moments such as these are matters of faith. To fail is to invite doubt into everything we believe, everything that we have fought for. The storm rage on. Cold never bothered me anyway. There it is. It's huge. That's incredible. Do I look like a cop?
I know what people taste like. Silent Breed is people! I have been watching you your whole life. I was watching when you were born, watching when you took your first step.